This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We want to thank you very much for joining us today. I'm James Just. We've got Richard Fields in the middle. John Cameron is down at the other end. And this is our uh, Thanksgiving show, so we'll give a message of thankfulness at the at the end. But, you know, first, I'm not sure there's a lot to be thankful for other than, you know, friends and family at the moment. We're le learning about the high cost of those lockdowns, not just the economic cost, the human cost. Out of, what was it? The suicide deaths out of Ohio, the suicides for are now the leading cause of death for children 10 to 14. We saw a, a couple of weeks ago, I think we had a discussion about how the, in Wisconsin, the suicide in a count, the largest county of Wisconsin, the suicide rate has doubled. And now we have word that nursing home neglect like deaths have surged, 40,000 nursing, nursing home what? deaths. Nursing home deaths, not due okay. to COVID, due to neglect or despair. They say 40,000, a new study has come out and said there's 40,000 nursing home deaths not due to COVID, but due to despair and neglect. And these yeah, are the I read, a headline, read, a, read a headline in the B saying that murder rates uh, in uh, Sacramento are up. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, it's all over the board, not to mention starvation deaths in the third world. Yeah, and that that's something we should talk about. And uh, I throw this number around. It's, it's so big that it's kind of unbelievable. Um, World Bank and who I think World Bank said uh, 150 million people are going to be pushed into the lowest level of poverty and and to comprehend how low that is, that's uh, less than two dollars a day uh, to live on. So you know again a lot of these people live in agrarian economies and and you know they're they're almost hunter gatherers. Uh, not really. If there's anything to hunter gather, they'd be hunter gatherers. So. Um, it doesn't take much to, you know, push you from subsistence level to starvation level in those environments, and uh, to see it happening in in you know wealthy countries where, uh, you know, the nursing home deaths and and all the unintended consequences, which you know pretty soon if if you let unintended consequences go long enough, they're now the intended consequence, and I don't know why anybody in the right mind would you know want to kill off a bunch of of people in in nursing homes, nursing homes. Um, but as long as it happens before inauguration day uh it's not an issue uh right. after inauguration day i uh have a i, I predicted that the uh, uh the the uh, the vaccine would, would happen shortly after or on election day i was six days off it happened six days later uh, i also will now predict that the uh all of the draconian government shutdowns on the coronavirus will end on inauguration day or shortly thereafter. Hmm. Well, uh, that, that stands to reason. And then the, uh, the, um, whatever kind of bad economy that, uh, the new, um, print it and ship it to the blue States government, uh, blames on Trump will be Trump's fault and anything that happens on the bounce, even though that's happening now and would would go gangbusters uh, if they would take these controls off. I mean, you know, people, despite a lot of people sitting on no money and, you know, having to tap their, their savings and borrow and run up credit card debt and all the rest of that, there's a lot of people sitting on money. Uh, there's jobs that can, that can be done that can't be done because of COVID. There's, there's certainly um, pent up desire and the ability to fulfill it. I wish I would have bought uh, um, cruise ship stock at the bottom. You know, it's uh, it's about th three or four times off the bottom right now. But I still think there's an opportunity. So, yeah, it's 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 crazy times. And and the the things that that I think we're going to talk about science behind this thing at some point. Um, did you want to do that now? Yeah, or? we can skip to it. Go ahead. We can skip yeah. to it, John. Well, what bothers me is that uh, this thing is cost. What the U.S. government has thrown, I don't know how many trillions. You got the number handy, Richard. How many right. trillions? Three trillion, five trillion, something, something like that. Yeah, yeah. It depends what number you're looking at, but it just suffices to say that it will uh, triple or quadruple the national debt in, in a matter of months. Yeah, and then um, well, not, the not the national debt, but but it'll it'll vastly increase 
the national debt. You know, it'll go from 20, 20 some trillion to 30 some trillion in a matter, you know, in a matter of months. Yeah, which is pretty scary. So based on, on all of that money being thrown at this thing, and, and now we're seeing some, some good come out. Amazingly, the, the horrible, evil pharmaceutical companies are, uh, now that they've uh, uh, busted the locks off of them and let them actually do some research and some testing, have come up with, with a vaccine that in the past would have taken years to create in, in how many months? I don't know, six months, something like that. And well, so, keep in mind that other than Pfizer, they were all getting uh, heavily subsidized as well. Well, well, well even, and, even and they've been working on COVID strains for a long time, so they didn't start from ground zero. They, yeah, they had a true. base. They had a baseline to start from. Well, anyway, the point I got, I sidetracked myself, and the point I was trying to make is, with all that money being spent, we still don't. You know, they're still they're still wondering whether it's droplet or aerosol. Uh, there's studies out there that indicate that wearing masks is completely useless and other studies that indicate that it isn't useless. Um, there's, um, um, you know, countries that have had virtually no lockdowns that have done better than countries that have had uh, tremendous lockdowns. They're, the, the numbers that I've looked at on, on curfews, you know, in some places show no good at all. Other places so case, show that cases increased, decreased, and increased. So um, the well, lack... Can, can, can explain to me how a curfew has any effect whatsoever. If anything, a curfew should uh, enhance the spread of the virus if it's airborne I, because it's packing more people into small places like uh, grocery stores in a shorter period of time. It's just, it's absolutely insane. The only argument I can make uh, is that, or the only argument I can understand is that uh, with a curfew, bars, which tend to lower inhibitions, will be closed. That's the only thing I can think of that would argue in favor of curfews. And if well, that's the case, you know, have a curfew on the bars. Uh, you know, let the rest of us go about our business and work night shift. About half an hour ago, I just saw a, a news conference by the World Health Organization that just released another study that shows lockdowns do nothing. They, they studied 160 countries, balanced every, and there's no difference on on the grand scheme of scheme. Yes, some you have yeah, the outliers, yeah. but the grand scheme of thing is that you can't tell the difference based upon just the lockdown. It's lockdowns yeah. by themselves don't do anything. Yeah, and the same thing with masks. The Marines uh, did a study where they took uh, 1,500 or, or so uh, Marines and made them do all of the social distancing and mask wearing and hand washing, follow all of the recommendations. Uh, 1,500 Marines did, another 1,500 Marines did not, didn't have to do anything. And you know that if they're Marines at Paris Island, they were following orders. They were doing exactly what they were told to do on both sides of the equation. Uh, it turned out that more Marines that were not, that were uh, masking up got coronavirus than, than uh, the, the control group who were not. Uh, likewise, there was a, a study out of uh, Denmark, which, and, and the Marine study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's not, you know, it's not some uh, conspiracy theory. Uh, the uh, a study out of out of Denmark showed essentially the same thing. It showed that masks uh, cannot be shown to protect people. It showed that there might be a statistical, might being the operative word, a statistical uh, correlation between spreading. If people ha have coronavirus, they spread it less. Uh, uh, less than if they, by wearing a mask than not, but, but you know, only, only to a minor degree. So uh, the science is uh, suggesting that nobody knows. And if anything, none of this stuff is working. Uh, but if you listen to the politicians who are not scientists say, I'm following science, they don't, you know, they're, they're just throwing science out as a word uh, to intimidate their opposition. That's all it is. Yeah, well, it seems to me like they're. Oh, I'm sorry, John. But it seems to me like they're just doing something, so they can be said to be doing something. Hey, look, we're trying. We're doing something. Whether yeah. that something is good or bad, or it doesn't matter because they're doing something. I think. Well, that's I think I think we can only assume that the the government is using secret science, and somehow they found out <laughs> that the that the that the uh, virus actually sleeps, um, and and it understands time zones throughout the world. And it actually goes to sleep at 10 o'clock at night and doesn't wake up again until 5 o'clock in the morning. But then you'd want to be out while it's sleeping. So I'm confused. I, I really can't figure out. You know, the, the, it's I, – I, I don't want to say this. Yeah, I do. Um, that that um, people – But you're going who, to anyway. 
No, I'm going to anyway. Uh, maybe even a couple of times in a couple of different ways, just for fun. Um, when when governments uh, can can do whatever they want to do, uh, people who work in government um, believe that doing something, um, you know, having forcing people to do something that they would not normally do has benefit. Whereas the three people on this panel and the other three people watching, no, there's more than that, um, are of the mindset that letting people uh, who are generally rational um, take the knowledge in that they get and make their own decisions on how they spend their money and where they choose to go and how they choose to eat and protect their family and all the rest of that stuff has better outcomes. And we know that um, in every other arena, um, allowing people greater choice, let me, let me rephrase that, not allowing the government to take away choice always has greater benefit. And why wouldn't it in, in the health world? And then when you look at, and I, I, I don't know if I've, I've written this down somewhere and put it on a blog, I should. Government is one size fits none. It's not one size fits all, it's one size fits none. You know that the, the IFR, which is the infection fatality rate for this thing, for children is like one ten thousandth, maybe even one one hundred thousandth of what it is for people who are 85, people who are, are, are up to the age, I think, of 20. Uh, you know, yes, they get the disease. Yes, they, you know, they're being called super spreaders, but I don't see no evidence that they are. Um, they don't get sick from it. So why are, are they under the same rules for people who do get sick? It's because one size fits none for the government. And then we have, in, you know, basically based on the initial first knowledge in, in the state of New York, their brilliant governor decided to take sick people and send them back to nursing homes so that they hey, can- don't, don't knock the Emmy award winner, okay? He got an Emmy, so, you know, he, he's- he got he's a a Governor Cuomo got an Emmy? Because his press yeah, conferences are so do well done that he got an yeah. Emmy for his press conferences. But it is, it is his, br oh man. I'm, okay, I'm, I'm so, not kidding you. you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, just, it shows you that maybe we should all not watch TV. Um, yeah. You know. It, Except it, for this show. Uh, his, what's that? Except, Except for this show. show. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would call this something better than television. I don't have a name for it yet. But the, the. The, the horrors of all of this data being out there and the contradictory data are, are just, uh, if I believe that people in government were actually smart enough to keep a secret uh, and communicate that secret to other people in government, I would think that there's uh, intent to keep the populace locked down. Wait, there is intent to keep the populace locked down as long, long as there is. It's their nature. It's in their nature to want to control things and keep people from doing what they want. That's how they get their jollies, but it's not working. So um, let people well, make not, their not working for the stated purpose. It works very well for the uh, underlying purpose, which is to make sure that you have a uh, meek, sheepish population that uh, will follow orders no matter what the orders are. Yeah, and, cool. a, and a population that's always fearful so that they are open to uh, anyone Be, who will go in and take away by fear, fear. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. I would, I would rather live in a in a in a place where there's hope. Anyway, we we went off track on this, I think, a little bit. But the the lack, the complete lack of science, uh, and even though all the studies are out there and they're publicly available, the people in power who've assumed power, um, and and fortunately, uh, there's a whole bunch of really good liberty loving lawyers out there who are suing their pants off right now. Um, they've assumed power that they don't constitutionally have in this country, and I think they're doing the same thing in Germany and all the rest of that. You think our protests are against lockdowns are crazy? I mean, they had to turn water cannon on people in Berlin. Uh, but, you know, the people in Berlin, uh, people in Germany have, have a kind of a racial memory of letting those in power have their way and they're not putting up with it. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that very, very soon, um, you know, people uh, in this country do the same thing. Well, when you talk about listen to the science, we have to be careful about which science. Mm -hmm. You know, it's initially they tell you don't touch your mask a lot because you're going to help spread the virus. And then they issue orders to, you know, take your mask down between every bite to eat. If you're eating with people so you're 
they're not which science are we going to follow yeah. but you're talking about germany not you know the protests in germany you know what good are orders if people aren't following them we've seen what was it 23 sheriffs around the state of california said we're not going to enforce any part of this the uh, governor's lockdown this latest governor's lockdown they're just not the, going to the do lockdown it. or the or the curfew the curfew well this is the so curfew the curfew the, the, and then the lockdown in general you can't have more than what is it three families over for thanksgiving or well unless you're the governor of california and it's one of your cheap bribers i mean lobbyists um uh, birthday celebration at a seven hundred dollar a head without wine restaurant in Napa called the French Laundry. Then you're, it's okay. Well, yes, if you are, if you are, you know, some animals are more equal than others. And it's yeah, I mean, I mean, this is the the case with with uh, unenforceable laws in general. An unenforceable law is something that can be used uh, selectively to go after your enemies. That's what an enforceable unenforceable law comes down to. Uh, anybody on the, uh, on the road at 10.01 is subject to being arrested uh, right now. And if you have, uh, you know, if, if, if you're not one of the sheriff's, uh, if you're one of the sheriff's enemies, the chances of being arrested are probably a lot higher than if you're one of his top campaign contributors. Uh, that's, that's the way it works. Yeah, I agree. Well, so I, so we'll go back to get some national news. Biden in, introduced some of his picks this uh, this week there, Richard. And I know you have some opinions on that one. Yeah, just moments ago, uh, State uh, Department of State, he uh, he nominated or he's going to, he announced that his nomination will be uh, Tony Blinken. Tony Blinken is a longtime Biden uh, assistant, worked for him uh, heading up his, uh, heading up his, I think, staff when he was, uh, in Congress or in the Senate on, on the Council of Foreign Relations, or not the Council of Foreign Relations, the uh, the Senate uh, Foreign uh, Policy Committee, whatever they call it. Foreign Relations. So, sorry, yeah, Foreign Relations, right. Uh, Homeland Security is going to be Alexandro uh, Mayorkas. Uh, he's a, uh, well, no, this is not a bad nomination. He's the guy that implemented DACA. Uh, DACA is, a, is a, an administrative, uh, bureaucratic way of actually doing the right thing, which is letting people who were uh, who immigrated to the U.S. when they were, you know, preschool and have never known uh, the the country where they were they were born, allowing those people to stay and uh, be educated and become part, you know, continue to get a job and and uh, operate essentially as as legal citizens. That's that's probably a, a good uh, pedigree for Homeland Security. I have no problem with that. Uh, Avril Haines is uh, the uh, uh, direct uh, the name for the will, will be named for the director of national intelligence. She's enough through the up through the rank CIA uh, apparatchik. She'll probably uh, change absolutely nothing. Uh, you know, continue to do what uh, our uh, security agencies have done all along. So that's not encouraging at all. For UN ambassador, he named uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield. She's a, a veteran of the Foreign Service, so probably not too much uh, change there, at least change from the, the pre-Trump days. Uh, for, for the NSA, National Security Agency, Jake Sullivan. Jake Sullivan is actually, was actually his campaign advisor on foreign policy. So uh, it's interesting uh, that uh, all of the people he is naming are, for the most part, uh, uh, Biden loyalists, people who... Uh, have been longtime cronies of uh, Joe Biden, as opposed to uh, uh, Kamala Harris cronies, and, and I think that's probably uh, a good thing uh, for question the. Uh, right. Well, for when you the, get done, Richard, I want to throw a question out. Okay, well, one more for the uh, presidential envoy on climate change, John Kerry, and he's calling this a cabinet-level appointment. I wasn't aware that we had created a cabinet. Uh, for climate change, did I miss something? That's well, my I think question. yeah, I think we should create a cabinet for climate change and put all the people who believe that that any of this regulation is necessary or will accomplish anything in the cabinet, lock the cabinet and throw the key away. That's that's my thinking. But um, you know, we we could talk about climate change ad nauseum, and I think I probably have. Uh, even if we did everything that the, that the, the crazies want us to do, their own numbers say it will make no difference. So why should we do anything? 
And and if I remember correctly, we're still in the Maunder minimum. But anyway, back to the Kamala Harris thing. So when President Harris takes over, uh, but I'm I'm guessing that that Biden is enough of uh, a politician and a sociopath like all the rest of them that even though uh, we all believe that the deal was he'd get elected and then Kamala would take over, it. Uh, when uh, it, it sounds to me like he might he might uh, try to stay for the long ride, even at age, what is he, 77 now? Uh, is he 77? 77, yeah. be 78 on the nomin- or Yeah, nomin- yeah. Or he's got a lot of cronies riding his coattails, and they want yeah. don't want to lose their power, so yeah. they're going to yeah. prop him up. It's going to be weekend at Bernie's. For, I'm, yeah. It's, yeah. you know. It might already be weekend. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen anybody. Uh, I think the, the president of the United States should at least, oh, maybe not. If they fail the mirror test, we should elect them because they'll do less trouble. And if they pass the mirror test, then they can't get elected because they'll cause a lot of trouble. But I'm, I'm. There's going to be uh, some, some, you know, power stuff going on. It's my understanding that that uh, Hussein, um, the people that uh, refer to uh, Hussein as Obama. Um, are are uh, in really kind of uh, holding the reins of power in the Democratic Party, but um, you know maybe maybe Biden's making a break for it, or maybe you know Kamala will just replace them all. I mean, what do you guys do? You guys think will she accept all? Well, it depends. It depends on how long how long uh, Biden can stay uh, actually in in the Oval Office, and that'll mm-hmm. depend on whether the uh, cognitive decline that we uh, have observed or think we have observed whether or not that uh, progresses or is real in the first place. It depends on whether the uh, the Biden crime family, and by that I mean his son Hunter Biden and his two brothers, who have managed to uh, turn Biden from uh, from a, a thousandaire to a millionaire uh, in the uh, four years since he uh, left the vice presidency. Uh, that's one faction, the, the Biden the Biden family. The other faction is the uh, Kamala Harris Obama. Uh, coalition and and there's a third faction too. I forget who it is, but th- there's any number of of uh, any oh the the Bernie faction, you know the progressive. Yeah, the progressive. Yeah. Like, we actually have a question from the audience about the Bernie faction. What impact is that progressive wing essentially of the per- party, the squad, the BLM wing, going to have on this Biden ticket? Are they going to be able to pressure him? It doesn't look like they're having much much luck pressuring him, really. Well, yeah, well so far the, the nominations have been foreign policy nominations, and uh, that would not be that's not really in the wheelhouse of the progressives all that much there uh, for all of their talk about being the party of peace or the people of peace they are really the party of redistribution and that's when uh, secretary of the treasury uh, federal reserve uh, board nominations uh, department of labor those kinds of nominations will tell you whether or not the bernie bros have any have any uh, uh, sway hmm. well based upon their uh, their success uh in in the election, uh, Richard, you pointed out that they're only they only uh, had their way in in safe drawn for them districts, and uh, you know anytime the the hardcore progressives, which I hate to call progressives because it's regressive, basically it's you know government like kings used to have, uh, ordering people to do things and redistributing wealth. Um, didn't do so well, and I don't think it played very well at all. And even even the New York Times has has said that uh, the, uh, the the Democratic Party needs to look at its its mission statement and maybe pick more popular causes. So um, um, you know, for the New York Times to say there's a problem, but that, you know that kind of brings up something else. They're interviewing these people. Well, it's the it's the so-called experts inter- interviewing themselves and. Um, Wondering how more black people, especially black males, um, what's from six to eight percent was that thirty three percent increase or six to nine fifty percent increase, and more Hispanic males voted um, voted for Trump this time than last time, and I think they're they're losing sight of the fact that that even though the guy's a clown. Uh, and and a kind of a mean natured person at heart. I think you know at least if you're going to be president, you should be nice. Um, did some things that directly benefited uh, Hispanics and and blacks that the uh, lamestream media, which controls all the messages we hear, won't take into account. And that's um, you know uh, reducing regulation uh, and. Uh, cutting down on, on the barriers to starting and running a business. 
Uh, and um, those are the things that directly affect the people in the lowest rungs of the economy. And, and when the lamestream media looks at it, they're, they're talking about, uh, you know, they did some surveys where apparently, you know, 60% of, of black people really firmly believe in border controls and 90% of them or some out, a crazy number actually want to have allow no immigration because immigrants take uh, jobs from young black men. So that's what the lamestream media wants to point at when they point at, um, you know, why why Trump picked up some voters from those areas. But I think people looked around and said, well, what's what's he doing? He's actually cutting back on this this mass of regulation and trying to, that's keeping us down. Because that's what's keeping people down, the barriers between them being able to go out and pick up a paintbrush and go to work painting houses are huge. Well, as LP, uh, vice presidential candidate, has, has uh, said, said during the campaign, uh, when you actually talk to people in inner city neighborhoods, black, Hispanic, or whatever, uh, their biggest complaint is, hey, I can't, uh, I've got a side gig that I, I have side to keep, hustle, yeah. Side, yeah, side hustle that I have to keep hidden in order to, to do because uh, of all of the regulatory licensing, uh, occupational permit requirements that uh, uh, government puts in my way. And uh, so, the, yeah, I think uh, point well taken that the, uh, the pullback or the uh, lessening of regulat regulatory fervor under the Trump administration has worked in the favor of minorities. Um, all right, and guys, it's interesting to see. We've got a minute left. And I want to make a chance. We're airing this on Thanksgiving, and I wanted to make sure we get an opportunity to thank everybody. I wanted to thank you guys, Richard, John, the whole Counterpoint team, Gail, Tony, everybody who's worked on Counterpoint in the last 30 years to give me this opportunity to come out That's here. That's a long and, list. And yes, it is. And I don't know it. So it's a, I want to thank everybody to give, have given me this opportunity this last year to be able to do this. It gave me a lot of training that helped me on my campaign and, and has helped me on personally and going off and doing other adventures. And so, you know, I wanted to make sure I thank you guys, the Counterpoint team, Access Sacramento, our viewers, you know, the people of Sacramento and around the country who have quite frankly been supportive of this this journey. Yeah, and I'd like to thank everybody that shares this on uh, YouTube, shares it on Facebook, shares it on uh, Twitter, uh, shares it on LinkedIn uh, and, uh, and comments uh, favorably from time to time. Like to thank everybody that uh, that watches and uh, refers the program to a friend. We really appreciate the opportunity to have this thirty-year legacy. And I want to, as the show ends, want to just say thank you to the one of the few rights we have left, which is the ability to express our hardcore libertarian leaning libertarian opinions without the Gestapo kicking the door in. And you'll know that you'll know that that right has gone away when this show somehow or another disappears. And with that, we have got to go. Thank you all for watching. You can visit us at libertariancounterpoint.com. Have a wonderful holidays. And please remember to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook.